We'll start in the Old Testament. First of all with Isaiah, the 14th chapter. Then we'll turn to the 28th chapter of Ezekiel next. Isaiah 14, beginning to read with the 12th verse and reading through the 19th verse. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? And thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? You, you see, the Bible doesn't give us all full light as we'd like to have, but you can see some gleams of light here. You see, Lucifer who fell here, evidently in what we call the pre-Adamite earth, ruled here on the earth, there was, there was something here before man came. He talks here about him that made the world a wilderness. You see, something happened between Genesis chapter 1 Verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 said, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 said, The earth was without form or void. Yet Jeremiah said he didn't make it a void. It was not created a void. The waters was upon the face of the deep. You see, whatever that original kingdom was, I don't know what it was. But evidently that's where the spirits that are here upon this earth evidently are the spirits of that pre-Adamite race. I didn't say they were humans. I don't know what they were. This Lucifer wasn't, but he was a created being, and they were created beings. And uh, you notice that he made the world a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. Well, the world wasn't original or wilderness and never has been since then. But it was destroyed. That's where your uh, prehistoric animals come from. This side of Noah's flood, we have all the animals we had the other side of Noah's flood because two of each one of them went on the ark, you know. You've got the same world system this side of Noah's flood as you had the other side of Noah's flood. And yet Peter writing about it said, you, you don't understand. Peter in one of his epistles said, the world that then was and the world that now is. He wasn't talking about Noah's flood because you've got the same world after Noah's flood that you had before Noah's flood. The Greek word cosmos there means world system. The world system that then was, was destroyed, Peter said. The world system that now is, is reserved. It wasn't destroyed by Noah's flood. Are you listening to me? So it does give you some insight. And you can see readily that Lucifer said, and I notice this, he said, I will ascend into the heavens. So he was originally beneath the heavens, wasn't he? He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So he had a throne and he ruled beneath heaven and beneath the stars, didn't he? Amen. He said, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Do you ever, you ever remember that in the Psalm, the Bible said, promotion cometh not from the south or east or west, but it doesn't say anything about the north. Scientists tell us that they're able to look off into space. You see that way over in the north, you see, there's an empty space out there they've never been able to probe. Amen. Well, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's what he said here in the sides of the north. That's where the throne of God is. Hallelujah. I will ascend. This is when he sinned. Now notice this verse. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. So he had to be beneath the clouds, didn't he? I will be like the Most High. This is when he sinned and when he fell. Yet thou shalt be brought down to the sides of hell, or brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. 
Now that full judgment hasn't been cast out. He was cast out of heaven all right and will eventually be put there into hell itself. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? So he made the earth to tremble away on back there and shook kingdoms that made the world as a wilderness and turned the whole thing into a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. That's the reason you find men in their diggings, you know, and so on and so, find things of a, another age beside ours. Uh, another interesting thought, if you just stop, you know, I mean, it seems to me that, uh, I don't know, you'd have to be blind to overlook it. Do you ever notice what God said to Adam and Eve after that he had uh, recreated the earth, you know, and, and after that he had made man? Do you ever notice what he said to them? Be faithful and fruitful, that is, and replenish the earth. Did you ever notice he said that? Replenish? Did you ever notice he said that? Amen. You know, you can't replenish something that hadn't been replenished. <laughs> Amen. See? That's right. See? Now, for instance, here's, you know, they, they, they put a glass of water. Sometimes I use, sometimes don't, but they put a glass of water up here. Now, just suppose I drink that and I said, here, would you replenish that? Well, you would have understood that it had been replenished. See, I wouldn't say refill that or replenish that if it was empty. I'd say fill it. Are you following me? Amen. Now, you see, God said to Adam and Eve, replenish there, so that meant that it had been replenished before or it couldn't have been replenished. Amen. Were you still out there? Amen. At least to me, this answers a lot of questions that you can't get answered otherwise. Amen. So to me, at least the hint is there. Are you following me? Amen. Then turning to the 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, we shall begin to read with the 13th verse. I believe it's Isaiah 14, the 12th verse we started reading, but here the 13th verse. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Actually, you'll find that the prophet here is talking about the same personality he was talking about in the previous reading. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. The ever precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee, in the day that thou wast created. Now, bear in mind there and hold in mind that 13th verse that it says, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. You see, he had something to do with music. You see, music belongs to God. The devil has perverted it. Are you listening to me? You see, uh, the... Uh, you, you, you see where all the stuff comes from that's perverted, but that doesn't do away with the real, praise God. Can you say amen? amen. Praise his holy name. Now, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created. You see, he's talking about a created being. He's talking about Lucifer, about Satan. He wasn't created as he now is. He was perfect in his ways till iniquity was found in him. Evidently, he had a free will as we do. He could make a choice. Then he went on to say, thou, he said, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled thee in the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee 
I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. They that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So we find from the Old Testament at least a little glimpse of Satan as he was in the beginning and of his fall. Twelfth chapter of Matthew. The twelfth chapter of Matthew, the 43rd, 44th, and 45th verse. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. The last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Then turning to Ephesians, the uh, sixth chapter. Ephesians chapter six, we begin to read here with the 10th verse. We read something further about Satan and all of his cohorts. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places are the margin, my Bible reads, uh, wicked spirits in the heavenlies. So you see that Satan and his cohorts are well organized in their work. Now then turn finally to the fifth chapter of Mark's gospel. We'll read something further along this line. Mark, Gospel, chapter 5. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he, that is Jesus, was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thy torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils or demons, besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out. Now notice he calls them spirits here. Another time he calls them devils. 
They can also be called demons. It all is talking about the same thing. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. Now you see now he calls him a devil. Uh, it called him, it said this man had an unclean spirit. Now he calls it a devil. Devil, demons, spirits are all the same. And had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil. And also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. We have been studying, or actually in this class, a series of lessons. We're in the midst of a series of lessons from the Gospels, studying the personal testimonies of those that were healed or delivered under the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this fifth chapter, Mark, we find three healings, deliverances, and, and our healings. This madman of Gadara, or the Gadarene demoniac, as we call him sometime, the woman with the issue of blood, Jairus' daughter that was raised from the dead and healed. If she'd just been raised up from the dead and not healed, well, she would have died again immediately with the same thing she had, but and healed. And we have studied them, and we'll go on to others, but while we're here, I seem to have the signal on the inside of me that it was a good time to go a little, little more deeper or a, little, a study, a little more in-depth study about the devil, demons, and demon activity. For we have not only seen in this case of insanity, but we studied also about the woman with the spirit of infirmity whose body was bowed together and she could in no wise lift herself up. We see, you see, that Jesus said that, notice, spirit of infirmity. And after that she was delivered, notice that Jesus said, Art not this woman whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years. So in connection, you see, not only with insanity, but in connection with many physical ailments, the Word of God teaches us and the Lord Jesus Christ reveals that demons and evil spirits have something to do with it. Now we realize, of course, that in many cases there are natural causes. But whether it's natural or spiritual, there's healing and deliverance, praise God, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. And in dealing with these cases, that's one reason that we need the Holy Spirit to help us. I notice myself in dealing with many cases. Now, for instance, we also studied another testimony in these lessons. You remember the man who brought his son as Jesus came down off of the Mount of Transfiguration where he had taken with him Peter, James, and John and gone there on the Mount and was transfigured. Moses and Elias, or Elijah, appeared to him and spake to him about his coming decease there in Jerusalem. And as he came down from the mount, this man came running to him, as one of the writers said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record it. One of them gives a little more, uh, Mark gives a little more in-depth study about it, adds some features that the others don't. And besought him greatly concerning his son, you know, and he said, my son is sore vexed and lunatic. 
and oft times he falleth into the fire, and oft times into the water. He had some kind of spells, evidently, seizures of some kind. And remember that Jesus rebuked the devil, rebuked the spirit, and, and before he left, he tear him, threw him down and tear him. In this case, these kind of seizures, whatever they were, these kind of seizures evidently were caused by the presence of that spirit. Now, many times people with epilepsy, sometimes uh, I, in my dealing with them, they are just healed uh, by the healing power of God. So that means then that it was just purely a physical condition, you see. Uh, of course, we realize that if man did not sin, the devil come on the scene, that, that we wouldn't have sickness and disease. But right on the other hand, that doesn't mean that there's a presence of a spirit there. You know, and I've had people delivered from epilepsy, you know, that we just laid hands on, the healing power went into them and never had another seizure. Never had another seizure. I remember we were preaching one time there in Pasadena, Texas, in the First Assembly of God Church. Actually, we just used their facilities, put on our own meeting. And a lady called from uh, Canton, Texas, up in East Texas. And she said, Brother Hagin, my little daughter is six years of age and she has epilepsy. Now, in our charismatic Bible study, incidentally, these were Methodist people, and, uh, but they were spirit-filled. They had a charismatic Bible study there. And we have been studying your books. And by faith, you see, we've claimed the healing of this child. However, she still has the seizures, you see. Now, would it be unbelief? Would it be all right to bring her down there and have you lay hands on her? I said, yes, under the right conditions. Now, I'll not have time to talk to you because we had a long line to lay hands on every night. I'll not have time to communicate with you personally, so let me tell you ahead of time. When you come down in the healing line, you say to the Lord, you don't have to say to me, say to the Lord. Now, we're not going there like maybe some of the rest of them are. We're going just for Brother Hagin to agree with us that the work's done. See, that way you stayed in faith. And so I remember, the reason I remember because... Uh, the lady, it was the only person there with a six-year-old child in the healing line. Nobody else there. See, she, this child stood in front of her and she stood back as I laid hands on. The power of God came on that little six-year-old girl and she fell flat to the floor under the power of God. Now, the next year, we were up in Dallas at Christ for the Nations with a, a crusade there. And this lady and her husband came up from Canton, Texas, and they testified to the fact that a year's come and gone. And from the time you laid hands up on her and the healing power went in there, she's never had another seizure. The next year, we were back there at Dallas, two years later, at Christ for the Nations, and, and, and uh, the, the lady and her husband were there, and now the child is eight years old, and they testified publicly again that two years have come and gone, and the child has never had another seizure. She was healed, you see. Amen. We were in a meeting in Houston, Texas, a number of years ago, an evangelistic temple, and then later on, a, a year later, we were in San Antonio, and, and so a lady testified there, had her son with her, 13-year-old son, that, that he had epilepsy. He was in the healing line. Power of God came upon him, and he had never had another seizure. Now, another year went by, and we was there in Houston just one night in a radio rally. We were in a motel there just using their ballroom, you know, for a one-night radio rally. And I made mention about this young boy that was healed the year before of epilepsy, and afterwards, a gentleman came to me, and he said to me, Brother Hagin, I was healed there two years ago in your meeting there of epilepsy. I'm 48 years old, had epilepsy all my life. Same meeting that this boy was healed in. He said, you laid hands on me, the power of God came on me. Now, see, I never asked these people, so I don't know what's wrong with them, you know. But we get all kinds of testimonies like that, and marvelous deliverances. We have hundreds of such testimonies. So through the years, I don't mean one meeting. And he said to me, I had epilepsy all, seizures all my life, 48 years old. You laid hands on me two years ago. I've never had another seizure. He was healed. He was healed. Right on the other hand, in the month of October of 1956, I was in Portland, Oregon, in the first Foursquare Church in a meeting there. And it so happened one night that there were three little children that were brought, about between six and eight. The older one was eight and the youngest one was six. Young parents there, somewhere around 30 years of age, brought these three little children. Now, when I laid hands upon them, I perceived that, that I was dealing with the Spirit. See, I didn't deal with the Spirit in either one of these other cases. So sometimes it can just be physical. You don't have to deal with the Spirit. Here's where we need the Spirit of God. 
Amen. Yes. Because you dealt with the Spirit one time with the same kind of case don't mean you have to deal with the Spirit the next time. Can you understand what I'm saying? Amen. And so it so happened, though, that all three of these, the same night, each night I cast, that night I cast the Spirit out of each one of them. Well, I went my way. You know, I don't, I don't know what happened because we were there only one week and this was towards the end of the week. But the next year, my wife and I were across the river there, across from Portland, Oregon, across the river there in Vancouver, Washington, in a meeting. And these folks were in our meeting. They said, Brother, you remember you, that night you laid hands on those? See, it's unusual. I, I never before do I ever, ever remember, never in all of my ministry, having three epileptics in one night. I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. Well, they said, neither one of those children have ever had another epileptic seizure. Praise God forevermore. Now, I can tell you some more about that, well, that way that we had to deal with spirits. Now, that doesn't mean, you see, that you set a course here and say, well, now I'll have to deal with the spirit. No, if you don't know about the spirit of God, well, then just go ahead and pray for them because prayer can drive out the devil. Praise God also. Are you listening to me? But what I'm saying to you is that from our studies, we found that the devil and demons and evil spirits uh, do very often are associated with physical deficiencies and sickness and, and so on and so forth. And, and that uh, sometimes the devil has to be dealt with. Do you ever notice in these mass healing cases particularly? Well, we see it in these individuals that Jesus sometimes dealt with spirits. Here he did in this case. But in those mass healings, when it talks about a multitude came together and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, see? And so uh, they, they, they sort of go together. But we here are, are studying a little more in depth. I think it'll help us. It'll help our faith. It'll help us understand the devil and his activities. We see where he came from. He was created originally perfect and he was one of the covering cherubs uh, of the same category evidently our place that uh, Michael and, and Gabriel held in the economy of God in days that were gone by. But that he fell through sin. And so demons, the devil, demons, evil spirits, the devil and all of his cohorts are fallen beings. They fell from whatever estate they had with God. They are fallen beings. Secondly, they seek embodiment. They seek embodiment in man. They seek embodiment. You'll notice here it says, he that had been possessed with the devil just lays it off on the devil, the devil. Then again it said that the man with an unclean spirit and then it says, when these people came out from the city after those swine rushed off of the cliff and drowned in the sea and the people who kept them went into town and told about what happened. People came out there. 15th verse says, and they come to Jesus and they see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And so uh, the Bible then said also, and the unclean spirits went out of him when Jesus gave them leave to go into the swine. The unclean spirits went out on him. So the expression is used, devil, spirits, unclean spirits, and so on. They seek embodiment in man. Now they can influence, can exert quite a bit of influence without embodying man. But naturally, the reason they want to embody man is because in this seen realm, because they live in the unseen realm. There is an unseen world, but that unseen world is real. Are you listening to me? Uh, but yet they have their widest range of expression, you see, in the physical world by embodying man and then working through him. On second choice, if they can't find embodiment in man, they'll take it, you know, in animals. These, these spirits besought Jesus, you know, don't send us away out of the country. Let us go into this herd of swine. They wanted physical embodiment. You can see that, can't you? Amen. So then we've, we've, we've discovered that from God's Word. I know we, a lot of times as Christians even as ministers of the gospel. I, I don't know why, maybe because of the lack of teaching or lack of interest, but we sort of skim along the surface of the Bible 
and just take some things for granted. Take for granted maybe that we know because we've casually glanced at a few scriptures. And uh, maybe are missing it all the time because we didn't really take time to dig into the Word of God and find out what God's Word said about some of these things. But I can remember how the Lord taught me. I don't know how He's going to teach you. His way of teaching you may be through me, and that may be you may not have any supernatural visitation. But the Lord taught me along this line through a supernatural visitation. In 1952, and you've got to bear in mind now that I'd been preaching since 1934. You see. Been in the ministry then for almost 20 years. Actually, 18 years. And you notice that, uh, that the, the Lord, I, I was holding a meeting then in December 1952 here in the state of Oklahoma. We lived in Texas. I was born and raised in the state of Texas. And I was holding a meeting down the southern part of this state. Actually, I say a meeting. Actually, it was, it was a, a teaching session. It's really a seminar. We had two services a day. They wanted me to come, this church, because I had preached there. The first time that I'd preached a meeting there, 1952 years before, when I went there, they had 137 the first Sunday in Sunday school. We had 156 people saved in that meeting, and, and, and 100 of them joined that church. And then I'd gone back again and held another meeting there in, in May of 1952. We had a lot more saved. Now then they're running four and five hundred on Sunday morning. And for the night services, running six and seven hundred. That's pretty good growth, you know, for that day. We don't think anything about a few thousand people today. But in those days, uh, you know, that was considered large. And so they asked me because so many of these people had come in under my ministry and so on, they asked me, would you come? And I'd just been there in May, you see, with a whole month, four weeks uh, in a different type of me. Would you come just for a teaching session? Just teach twice a day for a couple of weeks. So I went in December, just before Christmas time in 1952. And, and we had a day teaching service and a night teaching service. And we announced it that way, strictly one hour of teaching. We didn't have any, a lot of preliminary, just maybe saying one little course, have a word of prayer and turn it to me immediately. And I'd teach about an hour or so and we'd be back home in the parsonage. I stayed in the parsonage with the pastor's wife. And, and so we, uh, we would be back there pretty early, you know. And so one of these nights, we'd gotten back to the parsonage and the pastor and I were sitting in the kitchen, you know, at a little breakfast table, uh, having a sandwich and a glass of milk and discussing scripture. And uh, so uh, we got carried away discussing scripture, you know, and, and our sandwich about half eaten, the glass of milk about half full, and, and over two hours had gone by. We didn't realize that. But over two hours had gone by, and it's about 1130 at night, you see. And, and, and so his little daughter, 11 year old, she kept, you know, uh, I, I could see her. She'd come to the door, you know, and go back and come. And finally she said, Daddy, because uh, he would pray with her every night, you know, only the, the child had, pray with her and put her to bed, you know. So she said, finally said, you know, she didn't want to interrupt her, but finally she said, Daddy, come on, you know, and, and, you know, and pray with me. She said, I've got to go to bed. I've got to get up early and go to school. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have service till 10 o'clock, so we can sleep a little later if we want to, but she got to be up there at 8 o'clock. And so he, we, we jumped, you know, and looked at her watch. He said, oh, my dear, honey. He said, I didn't realize this that late. And I said, I didn't either. My time went by. So he got up and started, you know, I'm still sitting there at the table. And he got up and started with her and got to the door of the kitchen. And then he turned around and said, honey, come on back. He said, let's just kneel down here and pray, Brother Hagin, pray with us, and then you just go on to bed and we can resume our Bibles discussion. And so she came back in the room. He knelt down by his chair. She knelt down beside him, and I got up off of my chair. Now, I no more expected what did happen to happen than I expected to be the first man to ever land on the moon. I had no inclination. No inclination whatsoever. I, I, I had no you know, a uh, uh, supernatural spiritual feeling, <laughs> uh, you know, had no inclination that, that what was going to happen to anything in the world. Uh, when I got up off of that chair and knelt down, it seemed like that I just knelt down in the cloud. A white cloud enveloped me. And I just, it's the glory of God's what it was. And I saw Jesus standing 
about what the, where the top of the ceiling, you see, should be. The ceiling should be of the, of the room. Not the top of the house, now the ceiling. Standing right up there above us. And the first thing he said to me was, I am going to teach you concerning the devil, demons, evil spirits, and demon possession. For from this night forward, what is known in my word as discerning of spirits. You know, that's one of the spiritual gifts. What is known as discerning of spirits will operate. This is very careful to the wording of it. Will operate in your life when you're in the spirit. Now, now, none of these things should be try, you should try to operate them when you're not in the Spirit. That's where we get into difficulty. Many people try to give them what we call a message in tongues when there's no unction or inspiration there, just because they can talk with tongues. You need to learn the difference. That's not my subject now, so I'm not going to it, but you need to learn the difference. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, the only way I know to explain it to you, what do you mean by in the Spirit? The Bible says, you know, we'll take Bible definition. The Bible said in the book of Revelation that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, when he was in the Spirit, then Jesus appeared to him and he saw and everything's revealed to him that we have recorded in the book of Revelation. You see, right at that time, I was in the Spirit. That's the reason I was seeing him. I was in the Spirit. He lives in the Spirit realm. And so, another way that I would understand, if you'll understand what I'm talking about is, you can't just do that any time you want to. That's where folks have missed it. They think that spiritual gift and spiritual manifestation, you just sort of carry them around your pocket like you do your pocket knife. You know, they seem to think the apostles could do it. They seem to think Jesus operated that way, but he didn't. You know, and just any time you want to use them, well, you just, you know, you could take your pocket knife out, you know, and use it anytime you want to. But no, it's when you're in the spirit or putting it another way, the Bible said, as the Spirit wills. You remember over there in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, where the Word of God says that there's a diversities of gifts and differences of administrations, diversity of operations, but it's the same Spirit. He said, for to one is given by the Spirit the Word of knowledge, a Word of wisdom, to another the Word of knowledge by the same Spirit, and so on. And then he said, all these worketh that one and self-same Spirit. Now, from that time forward, see, I'd never had any such experiences as that. 1952, I'd had a vision of Jesus, 1950, this was the second one. 1952, two years and four months later. But you see, immediately after then, that was December, second two, you know, the two weeks of December, just the last two weeks, just before Christmas of 1952. So I went home for a week at Christmas time, and then I started a meeting in... Uh, Tyler, Texas, the last Sunday of 1952, and then ran on into January of 1953. I was in the Rose Center, Assembly of God Church in Tyler, Texas, where D.D. Lewis was pastor at the time. And so when I went down on the Saturday before the last Sunday of 52, and I was staying in the parsonage there next door to the church with he and his family, and and I was unloading my car. I'd got my clothes out of the car and suitcase and was, was unpacking it. And I heard a knock on my bedroom door and I said, come in. Brother Lewis came in and he said, Brother Hagin, you remember my little niece? She, the last church that I'd pastored, had been only about 30 some odd miles from Tyler. And I didn't know. At first I said, well, I, I don't know. He said, you remember my brother? And he mentioned one, his brother. I don't know whether they had another one or not, but this, yeah, I did have another. But this particular one I knew. And then I, I said, oh, yeah, I remember her. I mean, she came there as a teenager and visited in our services in some of the meetings. We had. Yeah, I remember her. He said, I don't know whether you've heard or not. I said, no, I haven't heard anything. Well, now, you know, she's, he thought I'd know, but I didn't know how she was now. But anyway, he said she's 23-year-old, young married lady. In fact, she has two small children, one just a few months old and the other, and, you know, about two and a half years old. And he said uh, she's, uh, she has cancer of both lungs and is bedfast. And, and, and so they, you know, they're just giving her up. Actually, they're feeding her six times a day and she's still losing weight. And he said, I just trust she'll be healed during this meeting. 
Well, I didn't feel, you know, I wasn't inspired to say it. I, I don't mean God led me to say it. I said it because of the knowledge I had of God's Word and because I believed it. I said, well, she will be healed during this meeting. Yeah, she'll be healed. She sure will. Well, we began that meeting, and that's what we termed a smaller church. And, and so in smaller churches, I only had healing meetings on Tuesday and Friday night, not every night. So Tuesday and Friday night of the first week, She's bed fast, you see. They got her out of bed, brought her to the services. I laid hands on her. She was in the healing line. She wasn't healed. Tuesday and Thursday night of the second week, they got her out of bed, brought her to the services. I laid hands on her twice more. That's four times I've laid hands on her. She's still not healed. Now, here are some things that we need to, uh, we need to come to grips with. You understand, of course, that she is a believer, member of a full gospel church. She had never been baptized the Holy Ghost. If her faith had been at, at the right level, doesn't mean she's an inferior Christian, but all things are possible to him that believeth. So if she had been believing correctly, well, all things could have been with her healed of cancer. And of course, I was anointed with the Spirit. The anointing was there, but some way or another, she didn't, didn't take hold of it. You have to realize this. Here's a fault I find with many people. In some areas, you can stand quite a length of time in faith for. I've done it for finances and they came to pass. If people have a critical condition, now for instance, like cancer there. If you're going to believe God, get in there and get the manifestation. If you don't get your healing, you better get the best medical help you can find. Because if your faith's not working now, it's probably not going to work down the road. Are you listening to me? And many times in such cases, if they can get to them in time, medically speaking, they can do something about it and then they don't have a chance later on. Are you listening to me? Now, how can you tell where you believe? I don't know. I can always tell. I said, I can always tell. And if I'm not getting it, I recommend to people, if I'm praying for them, if they're, they're very serious or critical, if I'm praying for them, I, I know I'm not making connection because if I'm making connection, we'd have the results. Then I encourage them to, to get help in a hurry because if you don't, you can die. Are you listening to me now? I want to make that very clear. Now, I remember Brother Osteen was talking about eight years ago, you see, they wanted to operate on him for open heart surgery, you know, because he's got, you know, there's a lot of that going on nowadays. And so he has... All these uh, arteries stopped up going to his heart. So he's in the hospital there at Houston. I remember I was in San Diego. He called me and, and asked me to pray. And I, 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 he said, Brother Hagin, I don't know. You know, I don't want to have to be operated on unless I just have to. But I'm not opposed to doctors, not opposed to medical science. So we prayed. I prayed with him on the telephone. And, and, and they're going to, you know, they prepared him for surgery. Actually, the next day, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna put him in for surgery, bypass operation, you know, open heart surgery. But in the night time, you see, he had a visitation from the Lord. Oh, he didn't see the Lord. But the Holy Ghost quickened some scripture to him. And the next morning when they came in, he said to his, the doctor there, he said, well, I've got another doctor on the case. And he said, who? He said, well, Dr. Jesus. And he began to quote the scripture to the doctor. And he said, I'm not going to have the surgery. I'm going to, I'm going to, I believe God. And the doctor standing there said, I believe you made a wise choice. Stand foot of bed. The doctor said, I believe you made a wise choice. So he went home. Well, now, you see, but he knew. How do you know? In here. I said, in here. And like he said, he said, I went to the pulpit sometimes to preach and, and did preach when it felt like I was going to fall. But he persisted and never simply disappeared and eight years have come and gone, you know. And he, like he said, I'm in the best of health I've ever been in. But he knew that. He knew I made the connection. Are you listening to me? I think so many people are walking in what we call sometimes just blind faith. Just trying to ape, imitate somebody else and fall flat on their face. Are you out there? Yes. Well, say amen if you can. Amen. If you can't, say oh me. <laughs> amen. Praise God. And so... Uh, th this young lady, I don't know why, you know, unless God would reveal to her, she's saved. She's a member of a full gospel church. She loves the Lord with all of her heart. I don't know why she hadn't believed God. Now, I do know this. You see that uh, 
Her daddy had been incapacitated in a truck wreck, you know, and of course she's a young married lady and she didn't have a lot of money. So Brother Lewis, he said, he told me, he said, I just said, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put you through the clinic. They, they really didn't know for sure what was all wrong with you. See, you know, we're talking about back there in 1952 and in 30 year period, they've learned much more in these areas. And so Brother Lewis said, I put her through the cl a clinic right here in Tyler. And he said, they, in the final analysis, they called her in and I was with her and said, well, Reverend Lewis, your little niece has actually cancer of the left lung. Just one lung was affected then. They wanted to operate on her immediately, immediately. Well, he said, we didn't just accept that diagnosis. I paid for it myself. I took her to another clinic, didn't tell her we'd been anywhere else, put her through it. They said identically the same thing. They wanted to operate on her immediately. Well, of course, she said, I just don't have any money for operation. The doctor said, well, if you can pay the hospital bill, we'll operate on you free of charge. We won't charge you anything. And Brother Lewis said, I said to her, now it's up to you. See, we ought to leave things up to individuals. Don't, don't try to influence them. If you're going to influence them, then you're responsible for them, either dying or getting a healing, one of the two. Brother Lewis said, I said to her, now, if you want to be operated on, I'll pay your hospital bill. It's, it's strictly up to you. She said, well, uh, just let me pray about it. And Brother Lewis told me, he said, the doctor said, well, I believe in prayer. I sure do. But in cases like this, you know, sometimes one week it can go to spread too far and you can't do anything about it. And so here, the quicker, the better. Pray in a hurry and let us know. Brother Lewis said, now, honey, you just make up your own mind, 23-year-old little mother, and I'll pay your hospital bill. If you want to be operated, the doctor said, we'll operate for you. You won't owe us anything. And so he said she prayed for several days, and then she said, no, I'm just not going to be operated on. Now, that's her decision. He said, I'll stand with you, whatever your decision is. She said, Brother Lewis told me, he said, she said, well, now, I knew two ladies. One of them was one of my own aunts. The other was a lady of our acquaintance that had identically the same thing. The doctor said the same thing about it. One of them was operated on. The other one wasn't. Both of them died. The one that was operated on did live a little bit longer than the other one did. And so I, she said, I just thought, well, it seems to me that you don't have much of a chance either way. So uh, I, at least if I die, well, I, I, I'll die not owing anybody anything. I won't owe, owe Uncle, Uncle Daniel the hospital bill. So I'll just trust God. Well, she trusted God the only way she knew. And now then it is spread to the other lung. It's too late now. You can't, you know, you can live with just one lung, but you can't take out both of them. And it's too late. And she's skin and bone. But we went on the third week. You know, I've thought many times, what if we hadn't gone on that third week because we talked about not doing it? What if we hadn't gone on that third week? Much is lost many times by not listening to God. I said much is lost. People have died many times because we and all, all of us together sometimes haven't listened to God. See, we want to pin it on one man sometimes, but a lot of times the whole congregation is responsible. Are you listening to me? Amen. Amen. Sometimes we want to blame somebody else. Sometimes the people sitting in the pew are responsible because they didn't flow with the Spirit of God. God couldn't have His way because they didn't flow with Him, even though they're saved people. Are you listening to me? These things are very serious. We need to give some serious thought to them. And I've thought about it a lot. What if we hadn't gone on another week? But we did. Tuesday night of the third week, that's the fifth time I've laid hands on the woman, the young lady. There she is. I mean, they're virtually holding her up. She's skin and bone. She looks like a walking corpse. Just, just wasted away. I'm standing right here beside the pulpit, you see. And someone's helping her. There's a, there's a line going across here. I'm laying hands on them as they walk by you see, and she stepped up here and they stepped back because she just can't stand up by herself, you see. They, they're holding her. In fact, that she's sitting here on the front pew till t her time comes. She can't stand in line very long. And they sort of stepped back. Now, I no more expected what to happen, what did happen, to happen. You see, just like there, uh, just a month before in that kitchen, in that full gospel parsonage down here in southeast Oklahoma, and when, when I got up off of that chair, I didn't expect what to happen did happen. I knelt down in a cloud. And here, you see, I've laid hands on her four times. 
I'm going to lay hands on her again, pray with all the faith that I can muster. See? I didn't feel anything peculiar. I didn't have any kind of hot flashes or cold flashes. <laughs> you know, we do sometimes. Because <laughs> you can feel the power of God. But I didn't have any unusual something. I didn't, you know, just as much a surprise to me as it was anybody else. When I laid hands on her, suddenly I was in the spirit. I'm talking about, I'm elaborating on what did it mean when you're in the spirit this will operate. See, that's what I'm elaborating on. When I touched her, I was suddenly in the spirit. Well, I touched her four times and wasn't in the spirit. I don't control that. The Holy Ghost does. When I laid hands on her, I've got my eyes wide open. There's more people in that, you know, in that auditorium than they are here this afternoon. That night, there were more people there in that auditorium. I got my eyes wide open. But when I touched her, you see, I was in that cloud. She and I were standing in that cloud. I couldn't see the people, though my eyes are wide open. I can't see the front pew. It's as close as that is. I don't see the altar there behind her. I don't see anybody. I don't see the people that helped her down there that stood back maybe three or four feet back away from her, you see. I see she and I standing in this cloud. I saw hanging on to her body over the outside of her body a little imp or demon. Looked like, a whole lot like a little monkey. Like a monkey and hang on to a tree limb, you know. And that's where it started. It was the left lung. And right over this. Here, see, right in here. Here it is just hanging on. I spoke to him. Did you, did you notice that Jesus spoke to this spirit? Yes. Then not only that, did you notice something else here? Now notice something else here. The scripture said that this man was possessed with the devil. Again, it said he had an unclean spirit. That one unclean spirit that possessed him spoke through his, used his vocal organs and, and besought Jesus. Did you notice that? Look at that again. Look at that again. And now notice that 10th verse. And he besought him much. He, he is singular. He besought them much that he would not send them. Them's talking about the whole legion of demons, isn't it? a way out of that country. That one that possessed him used the man's voice. Now, you see, if you had been standing there, if you had been standing there, with, like the apostles were there with Jesus, you would have heard this man say, or words come out of his mouth, don't send us a way out of this country. You would have heard that. Anybody would have heard that because he used the human voice. He possessed him. See? All right, now look at the next. Let's go on reading now. He besought, he, that one then, used his voice, besought him. Now notice the 11th verse. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. Now notice. And all the devils, now notice he calls all of them devils now. He also calls them unclean spirits. All the devils besought him, saying, all of them said something. The whole legion of them said something. S send us into the swine that may, we may enter into them. And forthwith, Jesus gave them leave and the unclean spirits. All the devils besought him and the unclean spirits. See, they're all called devils. They're all called unclean spirits, aren't they? Well, they didn't all use that voice at once, the human voice. How did Jesus hear them all at once? Because, you see, he's seeing into the spirit realm. Or let's put it this way. Remember now that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Because he's anointed with the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, well, yeah, he's the son of God, though. Yes, but my friends, the word of God tells us that when Jesus came into this world, he laid aside his mighty power and glory. He didn't have any more power to cast out devils or heal the sick than any other man until he's anointed with the Holy Ghost. I say quite frequently that Jesus is the son of God when he's 21 just as much as he was 30. 
and he didn't heal anybody. He cast out one single spirit. When he was 25 years old, 26 years old, 27 years old, 28 years old, 29 years old, was he the son of God all those years? Yep. But he never cast out one single spirit to heal one single person. Now, why? Because he wasn't the son of God? He was the son of God, but he had laid aside his mighty power and glory. And that's the reason he had to be anointed with the Holy Ghost, you see. And after he's anointed with the Holy Ghost, then he began to do these things. And one of these, so the Holy Ghost manifests himself through his ministries like he does ours, or as he will through the church as the Spirit wills. And one of these manifestations is discerning of spirits. So this is, among other things, you've got discerning of spirits and the gift of faith in operation here. Are you listening to me now? Jesus is seeing discerning of spirit. To discern means to see. It's supernatural insight into the realm of spirits. Now you can know of the, the presence of a spirit through the word of knowledge. It can be revealed to you that one's there, but you don't see it. That's the difference between those two. And so, you see, because he's seeing into the realm of spirits, then he sees these spirits and hears them speak. You wouldn't have saw them or you wouldn't hear them speak. On this occasion, no one else saw anything or heard anything. The congregation is sitting there. Yet instantly, I didn't see the congregation. If anybody said anything, I didn't hear anything. I'm standing in that cloud, that glory cloud. I saw that spirit. I said to him, you'll have to leave her. Now they heard what I said because I spoke it out. He said to me, and they never heard it. This spirit said to me, I sure don't want to. But if you tell me to, I have to. I said, I know you do. And out you go in the name of Jesus. When I said that, he fell off of her, just like a little monkey hanging on to a tree limb would fall off. And he fell down on the floor right at her feet. And he lay there and just whimpered and shook and whined like he was scared. Now, he's not so scared to me but he's scared of Jesus. Yes. And blessed be God in the name of Jesus. Yes. Now, when I say he's not scared to me, I'll, I'll qualify that. I mean, from the standpoint of being Kenneth Hagin, from the standpoint of being a son of God and a child of God, he is scared of me. Because he knows my authority over him. And he's afraid of you too. It's just like this. The devil and his cohorts are sort of like this. You know, people, a lot of you, how many of you folks are afraid of snakes? Most folks are. Well, did you know those folks that study that, they tell us that those snakes are afraid of us, more afraid of you than you are of them. But you see, you don't know it, <laughs> so you run. <laughs> and I think most Christians are that way. They don't know the devil himself and all of his cohorts are afraid of him, and so they run. When actually if they'd stand their ground, they'd run from them. Absolutely the truth. That's the reason the Bible said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Amen. Well, you mean resist the devil. Well, did you notice there in, in Ephesians, I stopped reading at the end of that verse where it said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And then it said, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the evil day and having done all to stand, stand. That's what it means to resist the devil. He's saying the same thing, different words. Amen. Stand. And so against him, in other words. And so, as that little demon lay there, you see, and just hooked and whined, you know, and just, I said to him, now, not only leave her, her body, but you leave these premises in the name of Jesus. And he ran down the aisle. I saw him. I saw him all the way. Now, see, I never saw the people. I looked, you see, back there. And, and the house is full. Never saw one of them, but I saw him run all the way back to the back door and run out the door. Now, the minute he ran out that door and disappeared, then the cloud lifted. Now, I got my eyes wide open all the time, but I never saw anything except him, and I could see the woman. And then she threw up her hands and began to praise God and was liberated and was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, she had been, since she's eight years old, member of Assembly of God Church, she's 23, never been filled with the Holy Ghost, 15 years, began speaking with tongues, was baptized in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Well, now, she went back. Now, she didn't look any better. Because you see, her body had wasted away and it takes a little time for it to put on weight. But she went back the very next day to the last clinic he'd been to and said, I want you to check my lungs and take x-ray pictures of my lungs and so on. And, and, and they said, well, why? Well, she said, something's happened. Well, they said, what happened? Well, you go ahead and do it and then I'll tell you what happened. 
So they began to check her and took pictures and so on and so forth. And they said, we don't understand it. Your lungs are cleared up. They're perfectly all right. Every test we run is negative. Then they ask her, what happened? She's testified to the fact that I told those doctors exactly what Brother Hagin said he saw and what I heard him say. And she said, three doctors said, well, we don't know the fellow, but whoever he is, our hat's off to him, more power to him. Evidently, he's got the answer. We don't. And she did not ask him. But the three doctors said, if you want to, we'll sign an affidavit that you had cancer, both lungs, and now you're free and healed. Now, you know what? 28 years have come and gone, and she's still healed. Has been for a good many years. Still free, still healed. Brother Lewis came on down to my meeting another place, said to me, said, Brother, you know, she's gained 16 pounds in the last 16 days. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Now, do you have to deal with all cancer patients that way? No. No. I've had others that were terminal with lung cancer were healed. I never saw any spirit or dealt with any spirit. But if it's necessary, I believe the spirit of God will show you. I said, if that's necessary. If that's necessary. Now then, my next experience along that line, I've had many since then, but I'll just, just rehearse a couple of these real quickly to show you. I'm, I'm, I'm elaborating on what it means to be in the spirit. Now, can you put yourself in the spirit? No, you can put yourself in a position where if it's God's will, you'd get there. If you could, all you'd have to do is just push a button, you'd be there. You know, sort of like Superman or some of them guys or whatever, you know. I never watch them, but once in a while you flash across to see some of them, you know. You know, just push, a, push something, you know, pull a lever. But, uh, but uh, you can pray. Amen. And there's two things about dealing with demons and with evil power as well as with sickness. You're going to have to, if you're going to deal with demons particularly, you're going to have to live right. Yes. That's right. Are you listening to me? And so we were holding a meeting, my wife and I, in uh, Pueblo, Colorado, the first Foursquare Church, with Brother McClure. And so I, I'm ministering to the sick. Here came a man. He was from Colorado Springs. He's a member of the first Foursquare Church and his wife in Colorado Springs. Now I ask people, what's wrong with them if I deal with them individually? If I've just got a line here and I'm going down, I just go down and lay hands upon them. But in those days with a smaller crowd, you can do differently. And uh, he just simply said to me that he was nervous and couldn't sleep. Now, I'll fill you in on this, what I was told after it's all over, see, so you can understand or know. Afterwards, I learned this. His wife said to me, you know, he hasn't worked in several months and actually had a mental breakdown. And actually, you know, you can't just send somebody to the asylum. They had a had a little hearing on it, you know, before the judge, you know, and the doctors and psychiatrists testified. So, and he's already committed to the asylum. They're just waiting about 10 days going to take him. See, well, he just said he's nervous and couldn't sleep. He's on tranquilizers and different stuff, you see. So I just went ahead and laid hands on him, prayed for his healing. In all the faith I had and sent him on. Somebody else stepped up in the place and I prayed for them. Somebody else stepped up in the place and I prayed for them. I must have ministered to another four or five. He went across on this side. There's three sections of seat on this side to my right and sat down on the front pew. And I don't know why, but some reason or other, suddenly I, I looked over that way and suddenly, like you snap your finger, I'm in the spirit. Now, see, if I knew how to do that, I'd do it every service. See, that's the reason God don't put it in your hands. <laughs> because he may not want it done every service. See, I had nothing at all to do with it. That's one great problem about Holy Ghost manifestation, gifts of the Spirit. We got so mixed up with it ourselves until God can't do what he wants to do. And so I happened to glance over that away, and when I did, see, when I first glanced at him, he's sitting there just like I see our organist sitting there. She's sitting there, see, just natural. But suddenly, like you snapped your finger, 
I'm seeing into the spirit realm. I don't have that ability. Only God can give it to me. You remember there in the Old Testament? I'm just supposing you know if you don't, well, take time to look it up, would you? Remember there in the Old Testament when the king, you know, was at war with Israel, you know, and, and there's, there's a prophet of God over there. He'd, he'd tell the king of Israel. Every time they'd set ambushments against the king of Israel and their army, he'd tell them where they were and they'd, the ambush would get ambushed. <laughs> and so the king said, uh, well, we got, he got his cabinet together and said, we've got a traitor among us. Somebody's given our plans away to the king of Israel. And one of his men spoke up and said, no, no, that's not it. He said, there's a prophet of God over there and said, he tells the king of Israel what you think in your bedchamber. And they said, well, if we, if we ever do anything, we're going to have to get him. So they got after him. And they got him shut up in the city and they besieged the city. See? And his own servant said, you know, reprimanded him, the, the prophet servant. And the prophet said, Lord, open his eyes. You see? Remember that? And the scripture said, when his eyes were open, now notice he didn't open them. <laughs> oh, he's not talking about these eyes. He's talking about his spiritual eyes. When his eyes were open, what did he see? Chariots of fire, horsemen of fire, and so on, all around about the city. See, that's what the prophet has said. He said, there's more with us than there is with them. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? My, 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 if he would see fit to open our eyes, what we would see. Hallelujah. And he saw a church of fire. You remember the story? You remember it? <laughs> saw. Well, what does it mean? His eyes were open. That means exactly that's the same thing that Jesus was saying to me. See, my eyes were suddenly open. I didn't open them. He did. Where I could see into that realm. And I saw, you see, I didn't know there was anything wrong with a man's mind. I've already told you that. I didn't know that then. He just said he's nervous and couldn't sleep. Man, that could apply to 100,000 different people. <laughs> Amen, isn't that right? I saw sitting on his shoulder. See, he's sitting, facing this way on his right shoulder. Now I'm going to show you how people miss it. Bless their hearts. I'm going to get down here where I can see the whites of your eyes. <laughs> You can sort of tell where folks are getting it or not. You get out where you can see the whites of their eyes. If they're not, well, go over it again until they get it, you see. See, here's where folks miss it. See, they live so in the natural, in the mental, and in the physical. I mean, born again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christians until they don't know there's a spirit world hardly. They don't know, hardly know it exists. And, and they're so in the natural that in, in spiritual things, you see, it's never spiritual with them. They immediately relate it to the natural. Yeah. Somebody said to me, is there any significance of him sitting on his right shoulder? <laughs> Forgot all about him being delivered. Well, he wouldn't make any difference whether he's sitting on his right shoulder or left shoulder or hanging on behind his neck. Nothing you know. significant whatsoever. <laughs> but they're all taken up about which shoulder he's sitting on. <laughs> If you ever studied theology, you folks are missing it. You, you, you fellows here going to Bible school, thank God. I hope you don't ever get mixed up with theology. <laughs> hope you don't ever get messed up with it. But if you ever studied theology, you'll find out this and studied the history of theology that way back yonder about 400 years ago in the theological cemetery, I mean seminaries <laughs> of Europe, that they'd have great debates of whether or not an evil spirit could sit on a pinhead. <laughs> what do I care whether he can sit on a pinhead or not? Amen. Some of them debated whether two of them could get there or not. <laughs> Great theological debates. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So one fellow, you know, he got all concerned about, is there any significance of him sitting on his right shoulder? No, I don't think it makes a bit of difference in the world. But there he sat on his right shoulder, and then he had his arm that way around his head, you see in an arm lock, right around here, right around that fellow's head. Well, you see what that denoted? That denoted that his mind was bound by a spirit. Right. I said to him, come here, brother, come here. He said, you talking to me? He'd already been down there and I laid hand. Yeah, I said, I'm talking to you. He got up, slowly walked back across here. I happened to be standing on this side of the pulpit there in that church right here, see. So he walked back across here until he stood right here in front of me. When he did, I spoke to the Spirit. I didn't speak to him. 
See, too many times folks are trying to deal with the person. I mean, in these kind of cases. Sometimes you have to deal with the person. Are you listening to me? Uh, they can do something about it, but he's too far gone. He can't do anything about it. But instead of dealing with the spirit that's behind the situation. And so I spoke to the spirit. I said to him, you're going to have to. Now, everybody heard what I saw. I said they didn't, they didn't see what I saw, but they heard that, you see. I said, you're going to have to leave him. And he answered me back. I know I have to if you tell me. Now, you know, you get over in these realms, you get, you get criticized. I mean, good folks, born again, spirit-filled, they don't hardly believe that the devil exists. Or they believe it on paper, but not actual, factual. And they said, the very idea of him claiming to see demons. And actually, he claimed he talked to them. Well, did Jesus talk to these demons? Well, I'm not going to follow anybody talking to demons. Well, quit following Jesus. Then he talked to them. Right. Yeah, but he was Jesus. Well, I know he was. But he's ministering under the power of the Holy Ghost. Same thing happened today. Can't happen. So, I said, you're going to have to leave him. He said, I know I am if you tell me to. Well, I said, I tell you to. In the name of Jesus. He fell off of the man fell down there on the floor and did the same thing that other one did. Just began to whimper and whine and shake like a little old dog that you'd whipped, you know. And I said to him, now not only leave him, but leave these premises in the name of Jesus. And he ran the outside door like that. Now, see, he didn't have to, the door be open. He can go right through the door because he's spirit, a spirit. And he went right through that door that was shut, ran out. Well, now why didn't you cast him into hell? Well, you keep coming, I'll tell you on down there a little later. Amen. So there's a reason why. Now, see, I told you ahead of time what I saw. I didn't tell the man what I saw. I didn't tell anybody. All he heard me say was, you're going to have to leave him. See? He said, I don't want to unless you tell me to. And I said, well, I, and see, he didn't hear that. Then he heard me say, well, I tell you to in the name of Jesus. Then he took his arms from around his head, fell off his shoulder down on the floor. And then I said, leave these premises. And he ran out the door. Now this man immediately threw up both hands, you see, and began to say, it just felt like an iron band snapped from around my head. You say, did he ever go to the asylum? No, no, his mind was stored. He never went to the asylum. He never went to the asylum. See, that happened back in the 50s. Now, 1974, just before we started our first class, charter class, Rainbow Bible Training Center. Ken was here working, getting it set up and so on. We were back up in the Northwest, Washington, Oregon. We were there in the meeting. He came with his son, testified to the fact he still delivered. Hallelujah. Then he said to me, Brother Hagin, he said, I want you to meet my son. See, because I don't know whether Billy was with us then as a word of faith, but, but it just so happened I was in over there on North Utica and our office is there. I didn't have an office there because I was on the field all the time. But it happened I was in. He called me. He called his son had been accidentally shot in the eye. See, with a bullet, not a BB gun, a regular bullet. And they said the only way in the world we can save him is take that eye out. In fact, his other eye, he'll go blind in the other eye. Very often they will in sympathy. We've got to take the eyeball out, all of it, you see. And so in emergency, he called. And I said, well, we, he said, I, I remember when I was delivered. I know God's power is just as great today as it was then. And right on the phone, I agreed with him. He said, I want you to meet my son, you see, just uh, you know, older now when he had called his little boy. He's a teenager now. He's eight, nine years old when he called. But when I was up there, because, you know, he was, uh, I think, 13, 14, something like that, 13, so about five years later. And, and, and he said, you know, never did take his eyeball out, and that's the eye. And, and the doctor said it never could happen, but he could see out of that eye. And there it was. Oh, glory to God. You know, one, oftentimes one miracle leads to another. Hallelujah to Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. That concludes this message. For more information about Kenneth Hagin Ministries, call 1-888-283-2484 or visit our website at www.rhema.org or write Kenneth Hagin Ministries, Post Office Box 50126, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74150-0126. And in Canada, write Kenneth Hagin Ministries, Post Office Box 335, Station D, Etobicoke, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M9A4X3.